Welcome back to operating systems. In today's lecture, we'll take a look at modern file systems. So we took a look at regular file systems previously, and so now we are looking for ways how to improve these. So what do we know about storage so far? We know that disk drives have a block structure. So data on disk drives uh, is usually stored in multiples of a block size, and a block size is like 512 bytes and disk drives provide random access to these blocks. So that means whenever I want to read a block of data on my disk, I don't need to start reading from the start until I uh, finally arrive at that block, but I can tell the disk drive, please go to that block and deliver these, for example, 512 bytes of data. But going to a block is one of the problems with real hard disk drives, so mechanical hard disk drives, because when our data that is logically connected like several blocks that make up part of a file, is distributed all over your hard disk, then, well, that means when you want to access data of that file uh, sequentially, for example, then your disk head has to move all over the disk in order to access the blocks belonging to that file in the correct order and deliver them back. So uh, this takes a lot of time. Head movements on a disk are especially costly, like they take multiple milliseconds. So essentially, File systems have taken lots of effort to ensure locality of disk accesses, so to place blocks which logically belong together, for example, in a file, also physically close together. Now, modern disks like SSDs don't have problems like these. They don't have mechanical components anymore. But because of compatibility reasons, they are also block structured. So uh, you can, for example, just swap out a mechanical hard disk drive for an SSD and continue working with it. SSDs have different problems. For example, SSDs can only sustain a certain number of uh, write accesses before f uh, cells in the flash fail. So SSDs would need something like write balancing. So uh, you have an even decay of the number of possible write cycles over all of your flash cells. Uh, but uh, well, that's usually something that the controllers inside of your SSD handle. Now, having just blocks of data on your disk is very inconvenient for you as a user and for the programmer. So you want a higher level abstraction, and we've seen that this higher level of, of abstraction is provided by the operating system, specifically by a part of the operating system we call the file system. So file systems provide abstractions, so you no longer have to use block numbers, but you can use something convenient like file names. And uh, these file names can then be used so programs can work with persistent data. So data that actually continues to exist after your program has terminated. So when you start your program for the next time or when you start of a program, a different program uh, that should work on that data, this data is still available. And a file system uh, provides a hierarchical view in the most cases. So you have a, a hierarchical set of directories, usually in a tree structure. And inside of these directories, you can store files. And we've also seen that uh, there are not only regular files, but you can also have virtual files on a virtual file system like PROC. And in addition to files and directories, you also have metadata. So the name of a file or directory, the size of it, its creation time, and so on and so forth. And we've already seen that there are different ways to map file systems to a specific disk drive. So approaches like these have worked reliably for decades. What are we going to change? What can we improve here? Now the first challenge we have is the reliability of drives. So especially with uh, physical hard disk drives that have mechanical components, you might have defective disks, so a complete disk fails, maybe because the motor failed or because its controller electronics failed, or, which is more common, a block on the disk or several blocks on the disk fail, maybe because of manufacturing defects, like uh, the magnetic coding on part of the disk wasn't absolutely perfect, or because of uh, some other wear out of your drive. Uh, so these are physical problems you have, and you can also have problems uh, that uh, like the system, the operating system crashes, or you have a power failure. 
Uh, so essentially you have the problem that you were in the middle of a write process on your disk and some of that data has been written whereas some of the other data was still in your main memory and is lost because you have rebooted or your power has failed. So what are the impacts uh, of such problems? Well you can have a complete loss of data if your disk fails obviously. You might have only single defective data blocks so for example an application can no longer read a file but all the other files might be unaffected and you can also have inconsistent metadata so for example a directory entry for a file is missing or there is a directory entry but the file is no longer there or a block that is uh, actually used is marked as free so whenever there is some future allocation of blocks this block would be overwritten even though it was in use now for physical or electronic problems with your hard disk there's this so-called bathtub curve here on the right hand side and this describes the overall behavior of hardware components regarding their reliability. So uh, what you see here is uh, the lifetime of a device, so the operating time especially, so how many hours you've used that device on the x-axis and on the y-axis you have the failure rate. And you see when this device is new, so we have zero hours or very few hours of operating time, the uh, failure rate of devices over all of the devices, not for a single device of course, but if you produce a million, you have a statistical distribution here. Uh, this is very high because this might involve all the production errors you didn't catch. So when the user just happily unpacks his or her new disk drive, puts it in a computer and smoke comes out, that means that there's maybe a bad solder joint you didn't catch while testing in the factory. So. Uh, these errors are easily caught, they happen early, and this means all the others uh, that survive, especially disk drives, are relatively reliable for a large amount of time, so usually for their projected lifetime. And at some point in time, the failure rate starts to increase again, and this increase of failure rate happens because of wear and tear. So, for example, uh, your motor or your head can get out of alignment, or for your SSD, uh, you have exceeded the number of write cycles. So essentially, since you want to reliably use your disk drives here, not only in a period where the uh, failure rate is very low, but you, of course you have to use your disk drives when they're new, and maybe you want to use them a bit longer than the manufacturer recommended time, you have to have measures that actually protect your system from defective blocks, defective uh, disks, or whatever might occur. And this bathtub curve here actually is not only related to disks, but it's actually related to almost all technical devices you can imagine. So it's a car or an airplane or something like that. Uh, and well, very often, of course, uh, for things that have to be reliable, you try to catch all these cases here still in testing in the factory before you deliver them to your customer. But then for consumer devices like hard disks, sometimes you might end up with uh, things that fail rather early. And maybe you have already experienced something like that and wondered about why does my brand new device fail on the second day I own it. That's the reason, or one of the reasons at least. So what countermeasures could you use uh, in case your disk fails or uh, you have data corruption due to power failures or system crashes? Now, of course, the first solution that every user of a computer is recommended is backup, backup, backup. So you can do frequent backups and these backups can be incremental. So you just back up the changes that you have made since the last backup. And from time to time, you should take a complete backup because, well, these changes over time would make it more complex to actually restore a piece of data if it's required because you have to go through all of the changes in sequence. And then again, uh, your first complete backup might have failed, so this would make it impossible to restore any of your data. So complete backups are also very, very recommended. And of course, backups have to be made to a different storage medium, preferably outside of your computer. So a USB disk, a network attached storage, uh, whatever you can imagine. And of course, your backup disk might also fail. And I've seen cases where uh, when uh, yeah, the main hard disk in the computer failed, at that point it was actually uh, figured out that the backup hard disk had also failed. So, uh, well, you were out of your data. So making a second backup 
uh, actually can't hurt. And of course, when you make backups, it's always recommended not only to check that the backup has been performed, but to check that you can actually read and restore data from your backup. So there have been cases where companies have been running backups for 10 years in a row, never tested if these backup tapes, for example, were readable. And then when the first case of data loss actually occurred, they figured out that their data of 10 years was lost. So always, not, not at every backup maybe, but, but we frequently also check if you can actually access your backup data. Now, of course, backups take time, especially in today's uh, well situations of multiple terabytes of data on a computer and of course they cause storage space overhead so you need to store that data somewhere you need to connect this external drive for example and you have to remember to do it of course so what other uses uh, or measures can we take to fight uh, reliability problems here now uh, as long as your hard disk doesn't fail completely, you can use checksums and we'll see in a bit how you can even use checksums when one of your hard disks in your system actually fails completely. So checksums means that you annotate files with uh, some arithmetic coding, which serves uh, to detect errors. So essentially you add redundancy. Uh, and there are two ways to do this. So one way and simple way is to add something like parity. So parity you've probably seen in your computer architecture courses. Parity means that, for example, for each uh, set of eight bytes, uh, eight bits, so for one byte, you store an additional bit indicating if the number of bits set to one was even or not. So this is even or a parity. Uh, and uh, if one of the bits in that byte would flip, then essentially your parity bit would indicate the wrong uh, yeah, parity, which means that at least one of the bits has changed. Now, this doesn't mean you can fix this bit. You only figured out that there was something wrong. So you can use more advanced methods like error checking and correcting codes, ECC, which is also used for main memories and large server installations. And this even adds more redundancy. So this, for example, enables you to fix one bit errors per word and even detect two bit errors. So this is very useful, but this also causes storage space overhead. And of course, the question is, where should this be done? So should we do the checksumming on hardware level, like with ECC memory, for example, or should we do it on the file system? So which part of our system is actually responsible for using checksums, which layer of our system? And the final solution, if something went wrong, especially if your system crashes and you reboot it and your file system is in an inconsistent state, then you can use repair tools. So you might have seen pro uh, programs such as CheckDisk or ScanDisk uh, on uh, DOS or Windows systems or FSCK, File System Check on Unix systems. And they go through all of your logical hierarchy, map it to disk blocks, figure out if all the pointers on your disk are still consistent. If uh, the metadata is consistent and so on and they can actually repair some of the inconsistent metadata but of course they don't know about the contents your file is supposed to have so they can't really repair uh, missing data on your disk. Uh, sometimes it can happen that these repair tools uh, take a wrong guess so it might happen that repairing a file system might lead to uh, an additional loss of data in the repair progress and for large disks uh, file system checks take a really long time so essentially this would mean your system if it would be a critical system like running your web shop or, or, or whatever would be unavailable for that amount of time until your system is completely up and running again now in addition to reliability challenges we also have the challenge of really getting a good performance out of your uh, our storage media so for example if we look at this disk drive here, a Toshiba X300 disk drive, which comes in capacities between 4 and 16 terabytes. We see that it has an average latency of about 4 milliseconds. It has a mean time to failure of about 600,000 hours. And the access is relatively slow. So the latency is, is not that good. And the access throughput also is well uh, on a level that is what you can achieve with mechanical hard disk, but of course not what modern computers need nowadays. So for the six terabyte drive, you have sequential access rates of about 130 megabytes per second. And when you do random accesses, so you have to do lots of head movements and around that, you get an average uh, 
throughput of uh, just a bit more than two megabytes per second. So essentially we need to do something about it. We have low read and write throughput, we have high positioning latencies, and the performance of your CPU and main memory uh, increases much faster than the performance of your regular mechanical hard disks would do. And so the impact of this is that your hard disk becomes the bottleneck for all I.O. intensive applications, so for example databases, and also for all I.O. intensive tasks. So when you boot the system, when you have to start up all the services that make up your system, or when you just start a program and you have to load the program and its shared libraries and whatever uh, data is used by the program on startup. Now one solution to actually hide this performance problem is to introduce a cache. So a cache for a disk works like a cache in the CPU. So essentially we keep an excerpt of the data of uh, the disk in main memory now so we can access it much more quickly. Uh, so especially what we want to do, we want to keep important data, but also metadata in memory. Now here's a problem, of course, when we only have this changed, for example, data in memory and not yet written back to disk, then when our system crashes, we have inconsistent data because all that data that was in main memory is lost when your system crashes. But of course, there's even more challenges. Another challenge here is disk management. So in early operating systems, the physical dimension of your disk drive, so how much storage capacity you had on your drive, actually limited the size of the file system you could store in it. So what did you do when your disk was actually full and you needed all the data so you couldn't just delete data? Well, the solution was go out and buy a bigger hard disk. So uh, if this happens regularly, you're getting very cautious and when buying a new computer or a new disk you actually tend to over dimensionize your disk because just in case you need more data so uh, if your disk was full otherwise well you'd bought your new bigger disk and then you would have to copy all the data of your old disk to the new one this means system downtime because you can't allow your users to uh, actually change any of that data you're just copying at that moment and this means uh, your system would be out of regular use for quite some time. So copying a disk of several terabytes over might take a number of hours. So we've also found a solution here and this solution is to introduce a virtual file system. This means that new disks are no longer mounted as complete file systems, but we can mount new disks as directories using so-called soft links. However, this is not transparent for the users and applications because they don't know which disk their data is now stored on. A single disk representing a directory can still fill up, so we still have to need uh, copy data over, for example. So the size limitation might still be in place there, though it's not a general problem for the uh, system overall. So let's first go back to reliability problems here. What can we do to uh, actually mitigate reliability problems? Now, the first idea is actually to make your block device driver a bit more intelligent. So that means that your device driver for a block device such as a hard disk no longer represents a single hard disk, but it again introduces a level of uh, abstraction by introducing, well, more or less virtual hard disks here. So the idea for intelligent block devices is to handle reliability problems below the file system layer. And the advantage of this is that whatever file system you build on top of it here, like X4 or XFS or whatever, uh, can actually benefit from this. So now we have our physical drives, of course, still. And we see that, for example, a block device driver might map to two physical drives here, and another block device driver might just map to a single one here. And all the common functionality, like buffering of data, keeping uh, redundancies and checksum on the file system, uh, on the drive level is now handled in this logical drives layer here. So whenever a file system actually is stored on such a logical drive, the distribution of the data to the actual physical drives connected to the different block device drivers is handled by this intelligent block device driver layer here. So for example, it could actually decide if there was some important data on a file system here that it would just write two copies of that data to two different physical drives to create sort of redundancy here. 
Now for performance problems, Unix has uh, introduced uh, buffer caches, block buffer caches for block devices such as disks for a long time. So this implements a buffer for disk blocks. So part of your main memory is actually reserved for buffering uh, blocks from I.O. devices. And the algorithms used here are very similar to what we've seen already with mem main memory handling, so page frame handling. And this, for example, allow allows us to do a read ahead. So because sequential reads are relatively cheap on block devices, uh, whenever we access one block, we can already access uh, a number of subsequent blocks and store them in memory in yeah, the expectation that they will be used soon thereafter. So if there's a request for this additional data, it's already in memory. Uh, we can also do lazy writes. So this means uh, whenever a write request from an application to a file system comes, we are not immediately writing this data out to disk, but we're only writing it back to our cache in memory. So uh, of course we have to write it out eventually. Uh, but this allows optimizations of write accesses. So for example, if an application would change data in a certain block on a disk very often, for example, it would keep a counter of something, then these write accesses would only write to memory. And at some point in time, we would just write the last updated version back to disk. So this means a RAM access is fast. So a write to a file system does not block the writers. The writer doesn't have to wait until this data really has arrived on the disk drive. And you do a free block management for the block buffer cache in a free list. So possible entries for the free list are determined using an algorithm, uh, which is usually LRU, so least recently used. And blocks which are already marked free, but are not yet reused, can also be reactivated, so we can do a reclaim. So this is very similar to your main memory management approaches you've seen before for just allocating, for example, heap data. So when employing this block buffer cache, cache the question, of course, is uh, when should we write data to disk? Because eventually we have to do it, in the worst case, before system shutdown, but, well, uh, that might be a bit critical. So essentially, we write to disk if or when, of course, we have no more free buffers, so we have to free some buffer space uh, so other applications can actually buffer their data in memory. We do it periodically by the system. So in many systems, there's a process called FS flush, which just is responsible for just forcing all the uh, buffers out to disk. And uh, there's also a special system call doing it called sync, uh, which you can also use as a command on the shell to explicitly flush all your buffers to your disk drives. And if you have really critical data in your application, you can actually tell your Unix system to directly write data to disk and not only to the buffer cache. And that is when you open a file with the option OSYNC, so the synchronous option, then after each write system call, the corresponding data is directly written to disk. So uh, how do we address data now? So we address data on a disk, uh, so using block numbers, and these block numbers are only relative and uh, unique uh, within a single physical drive. So for example, on a hard disk, you have block numbers from one to how many blocks you have on your disk. So you need for larger systems an additional number to indicate which disk your blocks on. So your blocks are actually addressed using a tuple uh, given by the device number here as the first part. So for example, the number of your hard disk in your system and then the block number on that device. And to uh, actually figure out uh, which part of the block buffer cache to use. Uh, a hash of that address is actually taken and is used to select one of possible buffer lists. So we don't only have one large block buffer cache, but we have several buffer lists in our cache uh, that can actually be used to optimize accesses. So this is a structure of the Unix block buffer cache here. So we have our buffer lists here and they're doubly linked forward and backward to enable faster access. You can go from your buffer list here, so your uh, administrative structure here, so uh, giving the different queues of block buffers here. And then you can go through the list here and go back here, but you can also go backwards through the list again by this double pointer measure here. And so you see you have different lists here uh, that actually uh, yeah, just uh, represent parts of your buffer cache in main memory. And then essentially, of course, whatever is a buffered block is linked to these 
uh, list structures here. And so when you have a hash value for a block you want to access, this actually refers you to one of the buffer lists and then you only have to go through part of your block buffer cache here, so only through one third in our example, to find the block you're looking at instead of having to search through all of them. And now this diagram gets a bit more complicated even when you want to consider the free list. Of course, you want to know if you need an additional block allocated in the block buffer cache where you can find this block and you want to find this in a quick way. So you have a free list in addition to your buffer lists of used buffers and this free list just links all the free entries in your cache together. So you can easily find a free one here and this is also like the other one a doubly linked list. So this again enables easy addition and removal of entries here. So how does logical volume management now work? And we give an example for Linux here. So we've seen uh, that we want to actually break up this one-to-one -one relation between a file system and a physical disk. We no longer enforce it. So what we have here is a set of logical volumes. These logical volumes look to our file systems like a regular disk drive or a regular partition of your, of, uh, on our disk drive, but they're just abstractions our operating system provides. And these logical volumes now can be uh, accumulated in several so-called volume groups here. And these volume groups now map to one or more disks. So volume group is an abstraction for one or more physical disk drives. And this volume group again can be split into logical volumes, what would be a partition on your hard disk. But the advantage here is now we're no longer constrained to a physical disk of our hard drive or to a physical size of a partition we have configured when formatting the hard disks. So these logical volumes here can be arbitrarily extended, shrunk or moved around even to a complete other volume group, whatever, if the file system allows for this. So file systems no longer access disks directly, but they just access a logical volume, which might be part of a volume group. And in turn, the volume groups then map to physical hard disk drives. And there's uh, tools to use this. So for example, we have pvcreate to create a physical volume that is managed by the system. Then we can create volume groups here. For example, we would create a volume group two consisting of the two disks def sda1 and def sdc2. And then we could create a logical volume with a size of 10 gigabytes with a name of home that resides on this volume group 2. And this logical volume now finally looks like a regular hard disk partition. And so our file system can be created on this volume group. And then you can use this data. But if you need to change something on this, there's tools to change these around. So this makes disk management more complex for the administrator. But on the other hand, it makes it more flexible because well, you can just move data around in, in case there's a new user whose home directory is on a certain volume group and he needs a terabyte of disk. So you can just extend this instead of just copying data around and shutting the system down for half a day. Now, the idea of actually providing redundancy and performance improvements for hard disks can not only be applied on the block device layer instead of the operating system, we can also implement it at a lower layer. And this was an idea also implemented at the University of Berkeley sometime during a research project in the 1980s. And this is called redundant arrays of inexpensive disks or short rate as an acronym. And the initial idea for these rate systems was to save costs. And costs should be saved by creating large logical disks out of inexpensive smaller disks. So the reason for this was that small disks were actually easy to manufacture, they had lower number of failures, and so they were relatively cheap compared to a large hard disk. So exam for example, uh, 10 uh, 1 gigabyte hard disk drives were much cheaper than one large 10 gigabyte hard disk drives. And so the idea was, can we somehow combine these cheap smaller drives to actually look to the system as a large uh, drive, uh, well, that's available uh, as one drive. So RAID gives us, uh, in, in addition to this well cost reduction here, a number of other features. So if we have several hard disks connected to our computer, we can read from or write to these several hard disks at the same time. So we would utilize the available bandwidth 
better by using parallel transfers to multiple hard disks. And now if we have more than one hard disk connected to our system, we could also use fault tolerance by adding yet another one that redundantly keeps data. Now there are two variants of RAID systems. One variant usually used in server systems is the hardware RAID. So there's a disk controller card and this disk controller has special management software and potentially a cache. And so this would present a RAID system so several hard disks connected to this controller as a single disk to your computer. But you could also do it in software. So this would be an operating system functionality again. So this would be a layer between the disk driver and your file system code. So when using RAID systems, there's different modes you can employ. And these modes come with different uh, yeah, capabilities that your systems can actually implement. So the first idea here is to just distribute the data of a large logical disk over several physical disk drives. This is what we call disk striping here. So for example, we have three disks in our system here. So block zero uh, of our logical volume is stored on disk zero, then block one is stored on disk one, block two is stored on disk two, and then again for block three, we start with disk zero again, and so on and so forth. So we can actually calculate the number of the disk where our block ends up by just taking the rest of the division of our logical block number by n. And the number of the block on that drive is then the logical block number just divided by the number of drives. Now the effect of implying, employing this disk striping is to have increased bandwidth because now we can read from all these disks at the same time. For example, if we have a sequential read of block 0, 1, 2, we can actually ask disks 0, 1 and 2 to deliver these three blocks in parallel instead of reading them sequentially. And uh, this is nice, but of course we have a disadvantage because now we have three disk drives, any of these can fail. So we have an increased failure probability that's multiplied by a factor of n here. So when you use multiple disk drives, you can also do a different thing to increase reliability. And this idea here is to mirror data on the disk. So to store data redundantly on two disks at the same time. So we have two disks here now in this RAID 1 disk mirroring setup here, disk 0 and disk 1. And each of these disks has its own copy of each of the block in our file system. So this means that we can still have the advantage of uh, RAID 0 of having an increased read bandwidth now because we want to read blocks 0 and 1. We can read block 0 from disk 0, block 1 from disk 1 because we always have a copy on both. Uh, but we have a somewhat lower write bandwidth because now we have to write each block we're writing to both of the disks. But then again, we have a higher reliability because now we have a copy of the data. So when one of the disks fails, we still have all the data on our other disk. And then, of course, we should take care of replacing that failed disk and copying data over soon after. Now, the disadvantage is, of course, this is a costly solution because it uses twice the disk space of a single disk. So to reduce this overhead of, uh, yeah, actually, uh, having a complete separate disk for redundancy. Uh, the idea was to just introduce a so-called parity disk. So for example, if we have three disks in our system already, then we would add uh, another disk uh, just to store the parity here. And this parity now is uh, actually calculated over the disk drives here. So data is striped over multiple disks here and one disk stores related parity. Now this means when a single disk has an error, it can be detected and it can also be fixed without a large storage overhead. And because we have many disks available here, we have fast read operations. But the problem is whenever we write data to a disk, we always need to update our parity. So the amount of data we have to write to this parity disk is potentially much higher than the amount of data we write to the other disks because that would be distributed and we always have to write a parity uh, information here. So this means our parity disk now becomes the bottleneck when writing data, whereas when reading data, actually it is fast because we can do parallel read excesses here. And our parity is just calculated like parity, for example, in main memory. So we're just doing a bitwise XOR of the related blocks of all the other stripes on the non-parity disks.
So to solve this bottleneck problem with our parity disk, we can actually also distribute the parity data over all of our disk drives here. So we no longer have a specific parity disk, but we have special blocks that contain parity information on all of the disks. So whenever we have to write parity data, now we can also distribute parity data writes over all of our disks. So uh, this is very nice. Uh, we can still have an additional parity uh, block here. Uh, so uh, because whenever we have this parity, and this would only allow us to uh, actually uh, fix the errors of one disk that failed and there's a RAID 6 mode that would actually have additional parity blocks. This can be reduced, uh, used to restore the data of even two failed disks. Now the disadvantage of having RAID 5 and RAID 6 levels here for dis with distributed parity data is that all of our data is protected which causes quite a high overhead even though maybe a part of that data might not be that critical and doesn't need that uh, much protection. Still we have to go one way or the other here. And RAID 5 now, so having this distributed parity over all of your disk drives is the most commonly used RAID variant in server systems today. Now with all these RAID levels you can of course also do a combination of these so you can have some RAID X plus Y system here or just called RAID XY to create hierarchies of virtual disk drives here. So the idea is to combine, combine different RAID mechanisms here. For example RAID 1 and RAID 0 means you have a RAID 0 where you just have your data distributed and then for each of this distributed data and then you have a RAID 1 mirroring here so you can combine the properties uh, regarding for example read throughput and reliability. So common setups would be RAID 10 so combining RAID 1 with RAID 0 here or RAID 50 or 60 so combining RAID 5 or 6 with a RAID 0 uh, distribution of data of all the disks. Obviously this takes a large number of disks, so this is mostly appropriate if you use very large systems or if you have very special requirements to your system. Now in addition to complete disks failing, which we might cover very well with using a RAID approach, we might also have the problem of just corrupted data or incomplete writes because of a power failure of our system or maybe because our system has crashed and we need to restart it and it crashed usually during some writes that were running on your hard disks. And of course uh, this can also be handled and one way to handle this is actually on a higher level. So this because it considers uh, and concerns the uh, consistency of metadata, this is usually done on the file system level. So instead of a regular file system which stores data and metadata, uh, some additional functionality was introduced in so-called journal file system. So in addition to just writing data and metadata, so metadata might be stored in inodes, a journal file system writes a protocol of the changes. So for each write access that happens to data or metadata, it actually keeps a separate information on disk, which what these changes are. So these changes are then part of a so-called transaction. And a transaction is a set of related operations. So for example, we write a block of data to a file which is uh, to disk which is part of a new file and then we create a directory entry for this. Obviously this is part of a transaction because if we only wrote the data to our disk without creating a directory entry we wouldn't be able to access it and if we would only write the directory entry without writing the data block to our disk then we'd have a directory entry pointing to non-existent data. So this writing of a data block and the correspondent metadata, for example, need to be done in a single indivisible uh, yeah, operation and that's what we call a transaction here. So examples for transactions might be to create, to delete, to expand or to shorten files, to change file attributes or to rename a file. So all changes to the file system are not only performed on the file system data and metadata itself, but as I said, they're also stored in addition in the so-called protocol file, which is usually called a log file. And when something goes wrong, so for example, you've written a block of data, but not its directory entry and your power fails, then when you reboot your system, your operating system can now check the log uh, for consistency. So for example, uh, do we have any information on the data blocks and directory entries here and then it can try to fix this information to avoid inconsistencies. So in a journal file system 
This protocol entry or log entry is generated for each single operation of a transaction. And after this log entry has been generated, then the change to the file system is actually carried out. So uh, this is important. So a protocol entry is always written to disk before the change itself takes place. So if something was actually changed on a disk, uh, we know that the related protocol entry is also found on that disk. But if there's a protocol entry and the changes are not yet on that disk, we know that there has been something that was interrupted uh, between these two operations. So when your operating system boots up again after a crash or a power failure, it checks if all the changes that are recorded in the log file are actually present on the disks. So uh, if this is not the case, then we can either repeat a transaction or uh, we can commit the transaction if all protocol entries are available on the disk. We call this operation a redo. So we're just writing the complete transaction again. Or if we had a started transaction that has not been completed, then we can actually revoke it. So none of, uh, no part of that transaction would actually appear on the disk. So that doesn't mean we uh, have an absolutely no data loss because we would undo some of the started transactions that happened when uh, we had to restart our system. But it means we have a consistent state. So we don't have any data that's not pointed to by any metadata or we have any metadata that's not pointing to any valid, any valid data on the disk. So what are the advantages of using a journal file system? So we've seen a transaction is either committed, so completed in whole or not at all. So we have consistency here. Uh, we can also allow users or programmers to define transactions that span, span multiple file accesses. So we have like semantic notations of transactions, even on the application level, uh, if these are also recorded in the log. Uh, journaling file systems make it impossible to create inconsistent metadata. And finally, booting a crash system only requires a fast check of the log file for consistency and the alternative to check the disk completely uh, going through all of your uh, trees in your data structures and so on. It takes a very long time for large disks, so journaling file systems actually make recovery of such an exceptional situation much faster. Now, of course, there's also disadvantages. The first disadvantage is, is that journal file systems are less efficient since additional log file data has to be written. And this is why uh, journal file systems usually only employ metadata journaling, not full journaling, also of data blocks. Uh, and this is widely used, for example, in NTFS on Windows, in X3.4 on Linux, and on the journaling file system JFS by IBM in the AIX Unix operating system. Now, one extension of journaling is uh, using so-called log structured file systems or short LFS. And these, uh, well, were ba built based on an observation. And this observation was that large caches reduce the frequency of read operations on the physical disk. And uh, the other observation is that write operations over your disk should not be scattered, but especially on real mechanical hard disks should be executed in a sequence that well touches several uh, contiguous physical blocks at once. And the radical approach of log structured file systems is to have one log, log that is sufficient for everything. So this means uh, you don't store any blocks anymore uh, on your hard disk. So you're not overriding blocks, but you only append this blo block information to your log. And you only store changes to metadata in your log also. And this means whenever you have to write something back to disk, you're just collecting write operations in main memory. And then you write them back to disk as a single large segment, for example, of one megabyte. So using only logs means your log always grows sequentially. So you always write block after block after block sequentially without having to reposition your hard disk head. And the only thing now that remains fixed on the disk is the super block of your file system containing the meta information, for example, how much space is free, what file system type that is, and so on. So this is pretty radical because it changes all the ideas of having to allocate blocks to just writing blocks, well, continuously to the end of a log. And then, of course, when your disk is full, so you've written log and log and log entry, you have to somehow consolidate this. So here are two examples for log structured file systems. So uh, 
here on the left hand side you have the Sprite LFS from an experimental Berkeley operating system called Sprite and essentially uh, the Sprite operating system just writes block after block after block in large chunks on the disk so essentially uh, blocks of a file can consist of uh, something written earlier in the lock and then something written later in the lock and the same for directories and your lock just grows continuously uh, till the end of the disk whereas on a unix fast file system you always have to reposition from directory to file reads to different directory blocks and so on and so forth uh, which means your data is scattered all over the disk so lock a lock on a lock structured file system essentially works like a ring buffer. So changes are added to, well, the front, which is at this side here, and obsolete data fall out at the end. And from time to time, you need uh, to clean this uh, data up. So you have a special process called a cleaner that is used to compactify uh, the lock entries and to release segments that have been completely obsoleted by, uh, by logically overwriting them. So we have an old log entry for block here, which was completely overwritten later. So we can actually remove this old log entry at some point in time. Now the effect of using a log structured file system is that you have consistency. So new segments are always added to the end. So either they're written entirely or not at all. The disk bandwidth is utilized to a high degree because we're always having sequential write accesses now because we always write large chunks out to the disk at one point in time. But if your free memory is low because you have to store this lock in memory, then your performance can be reduced significantly. So modern file systems actually refrain from overriding data at all. So they take this idea from LFS of just adding information to the lock but uh, they're more flexible when allocating free areas here. And these file systems are just called copy on write file systems. We've seen copy on write before when discussing a uh, fork in Unix, for example. So how to do copies efficiently of data on your, uh, in your main memory. And so these copy on write file systems actually only copy data when it's required. So for example, uh, we have a copy of a complete directory tree here. So usually we would have to com uh, copy all these blocks of information. And what we do now here when we need a copy of this, we just add a additional element Q here at the top of this representing a new directory tree. And this just points to the existing blocks of our disks. And what this means is that we only have to create this new block Q instead of copying the whole hierarchy over. And only when we recognize that there's a write taking place to one of these shared blocks, then we have to copy it over. And that's exactly the same as what happens with copy on write when we do a fork. So first the two processes, parent and child process, have a shared address space. And then when one of them does a write, we actually have to copy only that page over here. So that's very, very convenient. And this is actually the basis for the efficient creation of what we call snapshots. So a snapshot is essentially taking the state of a system at a certain point in time. Uh, so in case of something going wrong, you could actually roll back to that snapshot and set up freshly again from that point. And many of these features we've been discussing here have been integrated in file systems which are in development. So one of the file systems uh, was uh, introduced by Sun Microsystems which calls, uh, is called the ZFS and Linux created a, well, a version of a file system that took many of the ideas of ZFS and tried to improve on these and this is called the BTRFS. So uh, many people read it as BetterFS but of course well uh, yeah well calling it a BetterFS is maybe a bit preposterous. So the author the developer Chris Mason calls it a ButterFS and this is because it comes from a cow so from copy on write so this is just a bad pun. So BetterFS is widely used on uh, larger Linux systems and it has a large number of features. So it has actually a, a fast writes because it uses special copy on write friendly B plus trees to uh, allocate its metadata. It can provide these resource saving snapshots by just using copy on write. It uh, well uh, avoids loss of data by providing atomic changes and checksums for all metadata and data. It can use multiple disks, so the file system can implement flexible rate, which differentiates between data and metadata. Uh, it allows to change the size of a file system while the system is running, and it also provides for data compression. 
Now, one problem with uh, ButterFS is that it hasn't been that quite stable for many years, uh, but uh, recent versions actually seem to work very well. So let's come to the conclusion of today's lecture. We've learned that modern file systems actually have to consider the properties of current hardware so they can exploit large main memories for cache, they can use fast parallel CPU cores for example to check parity data and so on, and modern file systems have many new features compared to traditional file systems so they can have snapshots, they can have volume management, they can have redundancy and so on. Now we've seen the basic design decision we need to take when uh, creating an operating system is which functionality should actually be implemented at which layer? So should we implement, for example, RAID functionality in our block device driver, or should we add something like RAID functionality in our file system? Uh, the advantages uh, of uh, well uh, doing this is uh, we can be more flexible, and it's possible to make use of knowledge about the file system structure if we do it on the file system layer. For example, we could make use of different rate levels for data and metadata. But the uh, actually disadvantage of implementing uh, functionality in a file system is that all fi uh, file systems would actually benefit from functionality that's implemented on the driver level. Whereas if we implement functionality on the file system level, it would only benefit that one specific file system. So choosing a file system when, create, uh, when installing a computer is not an easy thing. Usually Windows doesn't give you a choice. On Linux, uh, well, for most distributions, you can change the file system you use on disks, but you, uh, for many simple installations, so that makes it easy for the user to install the system like Ubuntu, it actually uses one specific file system that was uh, selected by the designer of that Linux distribution, but this still means Linux gives you the option of just choosing another file system for additional disks if you like. So uh, finally here's two references to uh, really impactful papers here. So first a paper by Mendel Rosenblum and John Austerhut on the design and implementation of log structured file system and uh, by Chris Mason on the ButterFS file system here. There's many more on these, so if you're interested in more, let us know and we can provide you with additional information. So that's all for today. Thanks for listening and until next time. Bye.